Beautiful. Wow. What an awesome time of worship. And um, wow, um, Yvette and, and Abel, man, they just, they just blow me away. They bring it every, every time they're up here. I, I hope she understands that there's no maternity leave for worship leaders. She's, she's got to just hang, you know, endure right through it and uh, be right back up here. But um, Wow, it's good to be here. Good to be with you here at the at the bridge. And um, uh, love Lizette. Thank you for being a part of everything this morning. And um, she just shared some things. It struck me. She's talking about miracles, and miracles are happening now. And we believe and we trust that miracles will continue to happen. You know, before Jesus returns. But hang on to this if you don't hang on to anything else. And God still has. One miracle left in his bag. He always has the last word. He always will have, he has that miracle, man. And uh, you may not get your miracle now. I pray that you do. Um, But if you are a believer, if you trust Jesus, you know him, you, you love him, he's got one last miracle for all of us, right? That's gonna be awesome. So I look forward to that. We all look forward to that. Um, again, good to have you here, good to be a part of uh, this gathering. Um, real quick, I know a lot of times people flow in a little bit late. I just want to mention uh, one thing. Um, our, our gatherings coming up, our sessions, our gatherings coming up with Sam, Pastor Sam Lenore, Lenore in, um, in June, June 15 to 18. Really encourage you to be a part of that. Um, one slight little, this is the small print with any contest that you do. Uh, the small print is this, if you're not between the ages of 18 and 28, you can't like win that, that Apple Watch. But, you know, just so you know, go ahead and sign up, even if you're older than that. Booze, I heard booze out there. I'm sorry, it's young adults, man. The rest of you can come, but I'm only giving the Apple Watch to the, to the 18 to 28 year olds, all right? So anyway, just keep that in mind, but do sign up, do register. We do ask you to do that, and we'll keep you posted on everything that's going on there. Um, Wall series, uh, last week, Pastor uh, Jason O'Rourke, good friend of mine, I heard he just really brought the fire last week, so that's awesome, he's, uh, he's a good guy, and uh, we'll have him back some more, uh, but we kicked off the Walls series, and uh, we're going to continue that this morning. Uh, pray with me one more time, and we'll, we'll get started. Father God, thank you for today, thank you for our worship, thank you for um, ministry through singing, and ministry through praise and worship. It is very profound, and it touches us very deeply. Now, Lord, may you also minister through your word. May your word speak very clearly to us. May we understand more about you as we consider some passages in Scripture that deal with walls. And uh, may we learn and grow and become all that you would have us to become because of the time that we spent with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So probably um, five to six years ago, I decided that I wanted to get into running. I decided I wanted to be, uh, to start running. Uh, I figured it would help my overall fitness. I figured it would help me as I was approaching the age of 40. You know, this would be a good thing to do. And um, so sure enough, I did that. Now, in the back of my mind, I had always heard about, and something that kind of lingered in the back of my mind, because I'd always heard about this idea of a wall. And the goal of any runner, if you start running, your ultimate goal is to run a marathon, right? 26.2 miles. So when I started this whole running thing, you know, I started out doing a couple of miles and worked my way up to a 5K, 10K, uh, did a half marathon, which was, which was a big jump, you know. And then, but in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, man, I got to do that, got to do that marathon. But also in my mind, they, you know, people talk about this idea of a wall that you hit. In any endurance sport, whether it be bicycling or running or whatever, there's a point at which you hit a wall. And uh, so lingering in the back of my head was this idea about, about a wall that you hit, right? It's not like a physical wall, but, but there's something that happens to you. And uh, that's, that's real. That's true. Um, I ultimately did a... a, a, a a marathon and ran the 26.2 miles. And here's the thing about me. When I start a race, I, I'm not going to walk. My goal is not to walk. I could have like limbs falling off my body. I could be almost dead. I will not walk. I will crawl before I walk, all right? That's how determined, that's how crazy I am. Maybe it's masochistic, I don't know. But that's what I've determined to do. But the reality is there is a wall. 
there's a point at which your body just has gotten to the point where it says, no more. And you may be thinking in your mind, yeah, I'm going to keep on going, I'm going to keep on doing, but your body is saying, no, 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 shut it down. We're out. We're out. We're done. In fact, I read, I was reading this week um, a PhD in sports medicine. He was talking about what happens when you hit the wall. He says, basically, your body uh, commits mutiny on you, commits mutiny. Your body decides that It is done. It's nice that you think you can do this. And it's very, very pleasant that you decide to stand, you know, to sign up and be a part of this thing. But you are done because I'm out. That's what your body says. There's a lot of truth to that. There's a point at which in the race, in the run, uh, it it goes from being hard to being extremely difficult. It goes from being hard to where you are extremely fatigued and you can't go on anymore. It goes from being hard to where your legs feel like concrete. Mentally and physically, you're done. Mentally, what's going on in your head? You're thinking to yourself, I am at mile number, let's say you're at mile number 20 in 26.2. I got six more miles to go. That's a long ways when you've been running for three hours, right? So mentally, your mind is obsessing over how much more of the race you got left. And that's a hard thing to overcome. Your stride, you had a nice stride going, it's become a shuffle. You're just kind of moving along. You're not real sure how it's all going to go down. But you're quite sure in those moments that you cannot continue any longer. You have hit the wall. You're tired. You're weary you're done mentally and physically. It's a reality. Now, the truth of the matter is, and where this applies most significantly to to us and for us this morning, is that spiritually, you can also hit a wall. You can come to the place in your spiritual experience where you are weary of this world, where you are tired of it all, where you don't want to be in church, you don't want to be around church people, and you are just done with the whole thing. You're not really sure there is a God even because you're just not sure that he hears you when you pray. You're not sure that he cares much about what's going on with you or what you're going through in the moment. You just get tired And on top of that, you look outside of the church and outside of the spiritual people, and you see all the people who aren't close to God having great lives. They seem to be doing just fine. They're not tired. They're not stressed. They're not dealing with stuff. They seem to be doing just fine. You kind of go, man, all right, hey, I'm out. I'm done. Turn to Psalms chapter 73, verses 2 through 4. It's a psalm about a guy who hit the wall. He hit the wall. Asaph. A guy by the name of Asaph hit the wall. Psalms chapter 73. It's a great psalm. You have to read the entire chapter to get the full effect of it. But essentially, Asaph is a guy who grew up in the church and he is the worship leader. He is the vet of, of his church. And he is a worship leader. He's probably a young adult and he leads worship every week in his church. But he is done. Listen to the language. Listen to the picture that is painted in Psalms chapter 73. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. He's growing weary of all this. He says, I've been doing everything I was supposed to do. I've grown up in the church. I've gone done everything. I stand up. I lead people in worship, but my feet, I'm having a hard time running this race because I see what's going on around me, and I see the prosperity of people who are far from God, and here I am, and I'm struggling, man. You ever hit the wall? There are times when we hit the wall spiritually, and it's tough, man. So here's, here's another wall, though. That's, that's a wall that we can almost, we can absolutely identify with. And the second wall is a little bit harder to identify with, but it's absolutely true for all of us. The first one, yeah, we get tired, we get weary in this race, no question. The second one is a little bit harder to stomach. It's, called, it's, it's more like a rebellion sort of a wall. It's the type of thing where we decide in our lives, spiritually, that we're just going to kind of do our own thing and ignore God. It's sort of the sin that sort of 
emerges in our life and we begin to sort of do our own thing. We have our own will. We have our own life, our own agenda. We begin to go about doing things despite what God would have us to do. There's no longer these, these prayers to God to ask what I should do. There's no longer an understanding of, of principles from the Bible that guide my life and steer me in the direction that I should go and sort of tell me what to do. I decide that I'm going to do my own thing. It's not always the best thing for me spiritually. Maybe it's hidden, concealed, sin, ugly stuff. Maybe it's just bitterness and envy and rage and all kinds of nasty stuff that I harbor in my heart. And God's been calling me, you got to deal with that. God's been telling you, you got to deal with that. And I just refuse to deal with it because I just want to do my own thing. It's this rebellion wall. Now it's interesting with this second type of wall, you eventually come to the place where you are like, who God describes in the book of Revelation as lukewarm, how God becomes really sick of the people because they no longer need God. In fact, it says there that they are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They think they got it all together. They think they're making the best decisions for their lives. They think that they know what's going on. And God sort of comes at them and says, no, 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 you do not realize that you are pitiful without me. You are pitiful, naked, without me. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're going to take a look at one of these walls that some of God's people came up against. We're going to look at it in Ezekiel chapter 8. But here's the thing. The wall is not the end for us. God never had in mind that when we come up against these walls that they should destroy us. In fact, in fact, um, when we when we're either you know, struggling through the, the weariness wall or we're struggling through the rebellion wall, God shows up in those moments in a powerful way. Now with the rebellion wall, which is kind of where this, where this story focuses us, God shows up in a rather unpleasant way. But sometimes this unpleasantness of God is God's gateway to the best for us. So God shows up and it's kind of like we hit this judgment wall. Yeah, God shows up in the, in the midst of us struggling to continue in a relationship with him, especially when it comes to rebellion, and there's judgment. Now, that's a hard word, I know. It's politically incorrect to suggest that there is a God, and he actually judges us, or challenges us, or calls us to a different way of living. I know, and trust me, I am all about grace. I believe in it, but I also believe in a God who is convinced that we cannot stay where we are spiritually, especially when we are in rebellion. He's a God who loves us so much, and out of his grace for us, he meets us when we hit that wall of rebellion, not in order to destroy us, but in fact, to take us to a much better place. Here's the thing. When you hit the wall and you're thinking about quitting or you're thinking about rebelling, God steps into that place and he, he may bring about judgment, but it's not for your condemnation. It's not to get rid of you. It's, it is, in fact, because he always has a better way. He always has a better way. God always has a better way. You may think that you know a way around this wall. You may think that you know a way over this wall, but God always knows the best way and the right way. There's no question about it. So here we are. Here we are. We're dealing with these guys in the book of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is a prophet. You all know that. If you uh, are familiar with your Bible to a little bit, you understand that there are these, these prophets. And one of these prophets is a guy by the name of Ezekiel. And we'll go back just a little bit. We did the uh, Crush series fairly recently. We talked about idolatry. We talked specifically about a guy by the name of Josiah. Remember young King Josiah? He came in. He was totally turned off by all the idolatry going on in Judah. And he went about, and he started to crush all the idols. He started to clean house, right? Well, his grandfather was a guy by the name of Manasseh who started this whole, uh, these generations of idol worship and idolatry and false worship. And it just sort of had a ripple effect. And then there was a little bit of a reform when Josiah came along, but it came back 
God's people would always sort of fall back into this old pattern of worshiping false gods. And so when we get to the book of Ezekiel, it's just, it's not too far removed from the time of Josiah, and they're back in their worshiping idols once again. This infection, they're serial idol worshipers. That's what it comes down to. They cannot help themselves but to rebel against God and the true God and to worship these false idols. So God always sends someone to speak into, to speak to and to speak into our lives about where we are and what needs to change. He comes in and sometimes the prophet is a voice, most of the time, the prophet is a voice of judgment. If you do not change your ways, this is going to happen. If you continue to have this stubborn, divided heart, this is what's going to happen. God loves you and he will be with you, but he wants you to change. In fact, as you read through uh, chapter 8 of Ezekiel, it talks about how, and we're going to get there in just a second. It talks about how God is showing Ezekiel the different idols that the people are worshiping. And it refers to one of the idols as the, the idol that causes jealousy. Because God is jealous for our affection. He's jealous for our attention. He longs with everything he is to be with you and me. And anything that gets in the way of that, God is not happy. God is not happy. So here we are, Ezekiel, he's a young guy. He's actually somewhere probably between 25 and 30 years old. He, in chapter one of Ezekiel, God calls him, chap, chapters one and two, there's this huge vision of how God calls Ezekiel into ministry to go and speak very truthfully and with the voice of judgment to the people of Judah. And so that's what he does. God calls him out and about 14 months later, he has this vision God carries him off in the vision. He's a prophet. God, by his spirit, carries him off into vision. And he begins to see the depth of the brokenness of God's people. So if you go to Ezekiel chapter, chapter 8, verses 7 through 8, it says this. We get a little peek into what's going on with Ezekiel as God calls him. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court. This is Ezekiel in vision. He brought me to the entrance of the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. So a little bit more background. Um, Ezekiel has actually been exiled and carried off to Babylon. The Babylonians are who God uses to sort of bring this judgment on his people. So the Babylonians come in, they lay siege, they carry groups of, uh, of Israelites off to Babylon. And that is where Ezekiel is. So God takes Ezekiel in vision back to Jerusalem where he, they've been carried off. And he begins to show them the people who have been left over in Jerusalem, what's going on with them. And this is sort of how he does. He transports them via vision back to this place. And he's at the temple. And then if you go to verse 9, verses 9 through 11, we get to see what's going on, what God shows Ezekiel. And he said to me, go in and see, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel and Jezaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. So what he is shown is sort of the depth of the brokenness of the people. That they've turned aside from worshiping the one true God. And they've started worshiping animals and reptiles and all kinds of creepy, crawly things. And again, if you go back, you read the entire chapter, it says there that they worship the God, the God that causes jealousy. And here God is. God has to speak into this. Now, of all the brokenness of the people, there's a greater brokenness that's going on here, and that's the brokenness of God's own heart. For a people he desperately loves. A people he loves so much that he is not willing to lose them. 
a people he loves so much that he's not willing to just simply write them off and to let them simply forget about him. A God who is willing to pursue them, though they do the worst of things. This is the God that we're talking about here. Interesting thing about, um, about the book of Ezekiel. If you read chapters 1, 2, and 3 in particular, and, I, and even as you get up into uh, chapters 9, 8, 9, 10, 11, there's this reoccurrence of the word wheels. Wheels. Ezekiel saw the wheels. I think we sing a song like that, don't we? Ezekiel saw the wheels. Don't let, don't let me sing it. It would not be good. But we have this wheel. These, and it's kind of interesting that, because it's not so much about the fact that they are worshiping other gods, that's really, really bad, right? It's really, really bad that they're going to forsake the true God and worship these other gods. What's really, really notable and what's really, really bad is the place where they're worshiping these other gods. It even says there that the glory of the one true God leaves the place. In other words, their worship got so bad and they were such an affront to God that God himself didn't want to hang out in his own temple. But check this out. This reoccurrence of this idea of these wheels is quite profound in that God is not confined to a temple. God is not confined to a temple. It sort of hints at the notion that God, God has wheels. <laughs> God can move. So even though you are at your rock bottom, even though you are doing the worst of things in the worst of places, don't you think for a moment that God can't arrive there and take you out of the place where you've been? We have a God who can move in all kinds of circles. He's turned off by what you're doing and he probably turns his face away. But he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he gets around a lot. He can go to the darkest of places. He can go to the lowest of depths. He is a God who will stand by you no matter what. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Exile is actually a good thing. Don't dismiss exile. These people are, they're in exile, man. And exile, it, it sounds bad because you're taken out of the place that you were meant to be in. They were in Jerusalem. You, they were meant to be in that place. That was God's city. They, God promised them all that they were to have and he was giving it to them. But when exile comes, you're often taken out of the place that you were meant for. And the place that you were meant for isn't quite exactly what God intended for it to be. So exile is a rough spot. It's a challenging spot. You could actually hit the wall in exile and it would be a bad thing you want to give up. That's kind of where these people were. But you can't forget that this God of the universe, man, he works while we're in exile. And sometimes he does his greatest work while we're in exile. And so the one thing you can never forget, the one thing you can never forget, if indeed you have come up against the wall, and if indeed by your own stupidity and your own rebellion you have gotten yourself in the jam that you're in, you're doing the things, and it's causing the craziness in your life, what you can't forget is what the people in Ezekiel's day began to forget, and it caused them to go off and to worship all of these idols. Ezekiel 8.12, check this out. Check out what they forgot. Ezekiel 8.12, he said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness? God's still speaking to Ezekiel. He said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken their land. You want to get on a highway straight to rebellion and stay there? You believe that the God of the universe has forsaken you and forgotten you. You'll go anywhere, do anything, You'll, you'll fall to the lowest of depths if you believe for a moment that God has totally left you. They're, they're, they're believing, they're thinking God does not see us. He can't possibly see us. He has forsaken us. Let me tell you this, man. I don't know where you are. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you're going through. But I can tell you that God has not lost sight of you and he absolutely has not forsaken you. He has not. 
And though you are being pushed, though you're being challenged on every front to believe and to sort of dismiss God and to just sort of say, well, God has forgotten about me. I'll just do whatever I want. Don't you dare for a moment forget how God has led you in the past. Don't you dare forget some of your backstory. That's what happens. These people have forgotten this God who rescued them from Egypt, has given them blessing after blessing, and continues to say that I want to bless your future and give you, give you everything your heart could ever imagine. Don't you dare forget about the God who overcomes all sorts of walls. So God gives Ezekiel this little peek into the darkness of the hearts of his people in that moment. And exile becomes, exile becomes this place where God can sort of begin to do his most profound work. But it demands that we actually take a look through the hole in the wall and kind of see what's going on with us. And in fact, it may very well be, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like this. If, if you, you know, if you, you live long enough, you live to a point where you probably got to pay a little bit closer attention to your health and you may have to go to the doctor and get a stress test. I haven't done that yet, but maybe I need to, I don't know. But the stress test, they put you on a treadmill. From what I understand, what I see on TV, TV is such a great reference, right? It's, you watch TV, that's where you learn. Or just read it on the internet. But anyway, so... So you, you get hooked up and they put all these things on you and then you run and then they make you run to like you're going to die, right? Like, I thought this was supposed to help me, you know? But in that test, they're able to get a sense of how, of the capacity of your heart, get a sense of how well you are doing. That's kind of the point of exile. That God will put you in a place that will test you. And you may be in that place right now. But at the end of it, God's, God's plan and his ideal is that he's going to give you a heart that can handle things. He's going to give you a heart that doesn't turn away at the drop of a hat and begin to question God all along. He's going to give you a heart that says, I'm going to stick through this. He's going to give you a heart of some endurance, man. Christians have very little endurance these days. Sermon got to be 20 minutes, all right? <laughs> I can't sit that long. We can't sing that long. Don't make me stand up if you want me to sing. Don't make me stand up. We have no endurance. The slightest thing comes along, right? It knocks us off of, out of the whole idea of faith in God. God says, no, I'm going to give you a heart that can handle some stuff. Notice what he says in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 through 20. This is, this is really awesome. I will give them an undivided heart. That's what we need. An undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. We definitely need that, Adventist people. It's the spirit of God. We're afraid of that stuff, but that's another sermon. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. God doesn't want to see us lost and wandering. God doesn't want us to be in rebellion. God will allow us to continue in our rebellion to a point, and then he will step in. And then there's this wall of judgment. And the, 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 the key component to whether or not we change, the key component as to whether or not we crash and burn is whether or not we receive that heart that God longs to give us. Because if we continue in the spirit of rebellion, it doesn't end well for us. But if indeed we allow God to give us this heart of flesh, if he changes our hearts, if he changes us from the inside out, then something miraculous and beautiful and profound happens. We begin to be people that that follow after God, will follow my decrees, be careful to keep my laws. We become his people. We become his people. He becomes our God. He becomes our God in any circumstance that we face. He becomes our God no matter what. So what's it gonna be, people? When you hit the wall, 
doesn't mean you give up. Even if it's a wall of your own rebellion, God hasn't left you, he hasn't forsaken you, he sees you and he knows where you are. That's the very reason he begins to engage you. That's the very reason you get to struggle and you find yourself in exile is because God loves you. Don't take exile as a, as a, as a thing that God's trying to just destroy you with. Exile is a good thing. It could change our hearts. But let me end with this, Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through three. If you read the book of Hebrews, Again, you get sort of these this sanctuary and, and sacrifice and temple sort of language about, around the book of Hebrews. But what you also find is that Paul is speaking to a group of people who have also hit the wall. That's why it talks about faith. That's why it talks about faith all throughout the book of Hebrews. So let me end with these words from the book of Hebrews. Listen to this. Listen to this. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Check this out. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and give up. Don't give up. Whatever wall you're up against, man, don't you dare give in. Pray for, pray for a faith that endures. Father God, boy, we are in desperate need to make it through the walls we're facing. We trust and believe that, God, you're at work, but sometimes our hearts stray. Sometimes our hearts become divided. We begin to focus on other things and even give our affection and our love to other things. But may we always be brought back to you, believing full well that you are a God who sees us who hasn't forsaken us. Lord, may that truth be very evident in our hearts and minds and may we go with it throughout this day. Bless us and keep us and may we persevere. In Jesus' name, amen. Man. See you guys next week. Have a good one.